Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, at this webinar today. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Jacob Hussein, and I'm a third year Irish studies student here at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and today I'll be interviewing Nana Newby. Um, just a little bit about herself for those who might be unaware. Uh, she's the creator of the Alpha Project, an initiative she set up in Ireland to help empower students of migrant and refugee background, and the author of Nigerian Heritage, which is an interactive 50 page coloring book that celebrates the cultural history of Nigeria through illustrations and short stories. In addition to this, um, in addition to this, uh, she's also the project officer at the, UA, at the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent in Ireland and a member of the Anti-Racism Committee. And in her professional life, uh, Nana holds a bachelor's degree in law from University College Dublin and a LLM in International and Comparative Law from Trinity College Dublin. She's currently training at the Honourable Society of the King's Inn to become a barrister and also a PhD candidate at the University of Limerick. Thankfully, uh, she set aside some time for us today to talk about her experiences growing up in Ireland, share her views on the treatment of ethnic communities in the country, and to talk about the release of her new book, Nigerian Heritage. There will be a chance at the end um, for some audience questions, and you can submit your questions via the Q&A button below and we'll allow some time for that at the end to answer to them. So thank you for joining us, Nana. Uh, I hope I did you some justice with that introduction and uh, please feel free to introduce yourself if there's anything at all. Events. Yeah, I don't think I need to add anything <laughs> to that. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I'm glad. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, let's talk a little bit about your educational background in that case. Um, we know you're studying law at the moment, um, but let's take a few steps back and start with what inspired your love of learning whenever you were younger? Yeah, so when I was young, my as far back as I can remember, my parents would always um, call me a lawyer when I would say something or do something. Apparently, I, I had this advocate personality to me as a child. So when I when I became uh, when I was in in secondary school and it was time to choose what you would study in college, law was just a no-brainer kind of it because it aligned with my interests and in terms of I loved English I loved history so it was like be a lawyer or be a journalist and I was like I think lawyers make more money so I thought <laughs> but <laughs> um so yeah that was why I went down the path of law so it's something that you've always aspired to do it's not something that you stumbled into it's very much been at the forefront of your mind yes very much yes And what about your uh, um, being a barrister? What inspired you to put on that path in the end? Yeah, so that 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 was um, that took a little longer than I than I planned because when I started studying law, I was super excited. I was, you know, I thought it would be like what you saw on television, but um, <laughs> it definitely was not. And um, <laughs> I was like, this is not as fun at all as I thought it would be. So when I finished my law degree, but although while I was studying law, I did find some subjects that I was very interested in, and I was very drawn to the human rights part of it. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, okay, and I, I was like, okay, maybe I, I don't want to be a lawyer, but I do like this, the human part of law, maybe not necessarily the commercial part of it, but I do like the human part of it. So I went on to do my LLM and that was an international comparative law. And I focus on things like Islamic law and culture, African law and culture, and just things that were more interesting and seeing how the laws shape society and people. And so that, that, then I did that with my LLM. And then after that, I was like, I'm just going to go into industry and make money because the legal journey in Ireland is quite lengthy. Mm -hmm. And I knew I didn't want to be a solicitor because I had seen solicitors, I would shadowed solicitors, I shadowed the barrister, and I knew I wanted to, if I also go down the journey, I would be a barrister. But it's quite lengthy if and expensive because you're you're basically self-employed for the first few years, and I knew that it would be something that I didn't have the funds to finance. You know, it's kind of a privileged people's uh, profession, unfortunately. So I put it aside. But then when I when I was pregnant, when when I had my daughter, it was this thing at the back of my mind that kept coming. Because you know when you when people you see that on television when people have children and they say oh I would have been this but then I had little life came about and I didn't want that to be my story so I just said okay you know what yeah while I'm on maternity leave let me just study for the bar for the entrance exam let me just see let's see let's see what happens and I studied and I 
shockingly past it to get in anyway. <laughs> now it's a bit hard to get out. <laughs> it's taking a bit longer than I planned to get out. But that was why I decided to complete that journey. And on that journey, I've been privileged to have the opportunity to start a PhD. And um, so I'm, I'm yet yeah, it's all coming into, it's all becoming more complete. So I, yeah. Is it all interrelated? So your interest in human rights and law, would that be uh, interrelated with your own research in, into your PhD at the moment? Yes, yes, definitely. So um, I'm, I know that's a question later, but <laughs> it's going to flow naturally, it's a conversation. <laughs> so, yes, I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing a PhD looking at um, the relationship that people of African descent have with the Irish police. And my work, of course, is I, I work with the UN Decade for People of African Descent project as project officer here in Ireland. And so definitely using my legal skills in terms of an advocacy and an advocate, but use doing that in the research I'm doing. So the mm -hmm. research is where I'm, you know, applying those skills and hopefully bringing solutions and recommendations at the end of that, um, at the end of this research from that. So yes. Is there anything particularly enlightening that you've uh, learned through your research that you've done? Well, I just started in September. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah, so I, I just started in September. So I'm still at the very start. I'm still um, reading about um, the state of the art. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so it's not, I can't tell you too much about it yet. I was gonna say, I'll ask you that question in a year's time then. Yes, yes, when it's probably completely changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, as is expected. Um, as someone who's been then through the education system bottom to top in Ireland, uh, how do you feel that universities or educational institutions can be more inclusive of ethnic minority students? Yeah, so I mean, I moved to Ireland when I was about seven years old. So I started at primary school, second class. And that's really where, you know, school starts in terms of children's awareness of the world outside of themselves. So, I mean, I was, it was fine when I first came, but then over time, you know, became a little difficult in primary school, naturally, because children don't have much of a filter. They kind of say everything that comes to mind. <laughs> and it was like, oh, why, are you, why do you look like this? But um, so that's uh, something that, that I had in Ireland. And then in secondary school through college, it was, it was also a good, a good journey. But then I would say how in my university, I've, I found a group of people that I mixed with and I settled with, find, you know, that safe space. Well, I would say institutions, what could have helped the journey of the experience of, you know, um, other inner racism that many minorities and black people feel is just educating the children that in terms of not to hate difference or not to abhor difference. I think that would have really helped if they think, just did that, yes. Sorry. Um, do you think that racism or any prejudice that you experienced, do you think that came more about from, um, ignorance itself or do you, a lack of experience with another culture or do you think it was malicious and that inspired it sorry i didn't hear the end of that question did you think it was ignorance or do you think it was um malicious intent behind people who yeah, racism or institutionalized racism in the country so when i was younger of course it was just ignorance because there were children and adults back then were not so racist um now we're seeing otherwise <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> But apparently, I mean, we, we learn from, because in my work, I work with different African descent groups and the Mixed Race Association Ireland. And they, I mean, they have members who are as old as in their 80s who are mixed race, Irish, um, black and Irish. So they tell us that the Ireland is always, <laughs> it's, has always been openly racist. It's just, there was a time when it became politically incorrect. So it moved indoors, yeah. away from public view, but it was still something that was behind closed doors. And now, of course, with the rise of the far right, people become more confident. Um, it's coming out in, into the forefront. But yet it, it, it is something that has always been there. Ireland, Irish racism is more, well, used to be more like, um, what, like it used to be more subtle yeah. and less overt, which yeah. is very dangerous because, you know, you could be best friends with someone who who doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the opposite opinion, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm guessing you've used this experience that you've taken from growing up and you've channeled it to tackle racism in Ireland to help young ethnic people overcome any obstacles that might be put in their way because of it. Um, what challenges do you feel that young people face in Ireland today that perhaps they didn't face when you were growing up or perhaps because of what you face, they face it more now? 
Yes, yes. I mean, I, I definitely see. So when we, when I was growing up, there were fewer, there were fewer minorities, fewer black people, we were small in number. So, but now there are a lot more. You know, I mean, second generation. Like I wasn't born here, but the ones that are born here are much larger in number. And, and when I was a kid, we would, we would, in our cliques, you know, we are safe spaces. The black kids would hang out together and would walk together, go out together. But now because there are more of them, they walk together and they're called a gang. <laughs> And it's like they're literally just teenagers going to the park, playing football. But because they are a group of, you know, six foot tall black fellas and girls, there's, there's, more, there's more of a threat. I, I, I can sense that. I'm not just sense that it's a fact. There's definitely more of a threat from the public in terms of their parents looking so different. Because, you, I mean, we would see a group of um, Eastern European children walking together but you may not be able to identify them as non-Irish and it, they're less targeted as a result so th there definitely is that difference that these children are going through where they're more there's more of a they feel they're more they, they, there's, they're threatening people more with their presence and that's unfortunately led to a lot of racial violence not just from the public but even from, within their schools from Author, people in authority and it's and I and I say to and I keep saying this if you keep putting the, these if you keep putting these labels on these children they will inevitably lash out and it wouldn't be anyone's fault but society's fault you cannot keep we don't want them to become a self-fulfilling prophecy you, if you keep calling them gangs and gangsters and you keep othering them it's only going to put them into a shell further and further away from society and lead to less integration. So yeah, it is quite, a, they are definitely, they do have it harder than we did growing up because there is that target on their, on their backs. And my, my mentor, Dr. Evan Joseph always says, our blackness is our calling card is different. So like we, like it's something we cannot change. Like we cannot unblack ourselves. So we, so we have to deal with all the things that comes with it. And they, uh, they, they, they walk, they're in larger numbers now. So it's a bigger card that they're walking around with. So mm -hmm. Do you feel it the same as you did when you were a teenager? If you were walking around with a group of people, do you feel that sort of uh, prejudice against yourself now that you're a grown woman that you perhaps didn't feel when you were a teenager? Are you more aware of it? Of course, yes, definitely, definitely. Um, but again, as because you've grown up in Ireland, we, we, my people in my age, we kind of know not to gather yeah. to in a place that will be too that will be too intimidating to the public, which is not okay because this is our country. Yeah, be free to go to the park at, at, in, a, in a number of fifty playing football and all sorts of things. But we are conscious that oh man, <laughs> you know, like lads. <laughs> hope nothing happens here you know <laughs> so yeah it's, it's 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 an unfortunate part of living different in ireland do you feel your work with the alpha project has helped uh empower young people i suppose or help them overcome uh those sort of obstacles what exactly do you do with the alpha project in ireland yeah so yes yeah, so when i finished college the alpha project is something i did for about four years so i I'm no, I'm no longer work, working on it so when I finished college, actually, was when I, I decided to start the Alpha Project. And the aim was to empower young migrants in Ireland because so I was a student ambassador when I was in UCD. And basically what I did was try to encourage students in, sec in secondary school to come to UCD. So I tell them how awesome UCD was and to come and study law. And I noticed that a lot of the migrant students were a little bit less confident in their ability to because it, it, it is, it's like one of the top universities in the country. So they were like, oh, it's so hard to get in. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, you study hard and you, you, can, you can get in. But I noticed that there, was, there, wasn't, that, there wasn't that huge self, sense of self-confidence. So what I decided that to do was as a result was to show these students that it is possible to get into these universities and it is possible to go on career paths that are, that are um, prosperous and, and fruitful and successful. And so but we decided to do that by setting up the Alpha Project by basically we had mentorship programs where if someone was interested in studying medicine or science, we would link them up with a, a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer and things like that. And then they would shadow them for a few weeks. They would get to ask them questions and then also provide them with their network 
you know, for referrals, for jobs and things like that. And so that was the, that was what we did with the Afro project for those few years. And also we did networking events with different um, organizations as well. And so that's like, I, for me, I believe it did have an impact on students and we did get some fantastic feedback from students as well who said, wow, you know, I never knew that it was possible, you know, to be a manager in this as a, as a black person. And it was just something that I think was necessary because, because of the way, I mean, I don't know, I know it happens in the UK as well, where you have areas where that are predominantly black and then everyone else is everywhere else, is different places. So that we have in Ireland as well, where we live in areas away from the rest of the wider society. So you only see yourselves and they don't, they don't really have as much, they didn't have really have as much opportunity to see themselves in public spaces and doing well. So this was to bring them out of those spaces, bring them out of Blanchestown, Tala and Buchan and say, lads, we're in the IFSC, we're in the courthouses, we're in the hospitals. Like, so you can also come into those spaces as well. So that was, um, that was the Alpha project. And I, I said it's ended, but it's not ended because the, my, the, um, the spirit of the Alpha project lives on in my actual work that I get paid for now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah yeah <laughs> is there any when you think back to that time period is there any particular examples that shine to you that you look back and you're like oh I'm really I'm really proud of what I did there or I really made a change to that person's life yes so there, there, there is this girl who funny enough was studying law and but was not loving it at all which because it is a difficult uh, course mm -hmm. and it also it there's some issues when you're black and studying law. So, um, so I linked her up with um, someone who had qualified and was now a lawyer and had succeeded in that very difficult journey. And at the end of it, um, but I think it was this year actually, she came up to me, she was like, yeah, so, you know, I did the whole law, the whole four year degree, got my degree and I actually secured a, trainee, a traineeship. And she was so, and she really just thanked me for that, that link up with that person who, just that one person who showed her that it is possible for a black person to get into the top four law firms in Ireland. And I think that girl was like one of three black people in the top law firms in this country. So it was, that for me was, a, it was hugely impactful because now this girl is going to get in there and more people will see her and more people would know that it is very possible. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely see that. Um, but you mentioned there that there were some, uh, issues studying law as a black person in Ireland? Would you like to elaborate on that? <laughs> no, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, Ireland is, Ireland, is, Ireland is fantastic. It is a great country, but we have to understand that, you know, um, it's hard to break boundaries and barriers and show the next, the, the older generation that our difference isn't evil. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, so it's definitely harder to get work when you're different. So, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's not, it's, not, it's something that we hope to over, overcome over time. And it's something that, um, yeah, that is, it is a, a barrier. It's not a barrier. It is something that one does have to really tackle and really have a lot of restraint and resilience to go through. But, um, yeah, I don't think it's different anywhere else, unfortunately. Yeah, well, um, related to that, I guess, is um, racism in general in Ireland. Do you see it as increasing or decreasing, especially through your work? Do you see it as having that sort of impact where it decreases those sort of uh, racist stereotypes, I, I, I guess? Yeah, I think from the, again, I, I can speak from my experience and those around me, and, and I'm, I've been privileged to work with a lot of people back in the sense and, and do some research as well in that sense. So. It's always been there, but people, and that's actually, we, we have to give credit to the Black Lives Matter movement, where it has given people confidence to voice out what they have been experiencing. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's increasing. I would say we're hearing more of what is there and what has always happened. And we, and, and, and yes, the comp racists are more confident in Ireland. And that's something that we have to really work on. I mean, the, the last third, third no, you know, the um, convention for the elimination against racial discrimination when Ireland was, was before CERD, one of the concluding observations by Professor Vereen Shepherd was that Ireland 
leads to lead to make racists uncomfortable in this country because it's not possible to eliminate them. There will be people, there will be people who have racist views, but they ought not be confident. They ought not be confidently in our political spheres and say racist things and still mm -hmm. have their jobs the next day. <laughs> That's making them comfortable. So we need to get to a place of making them uncomfortable in this country. And we've done that. And Ireland is, Ireland is such an amazing nation that it, we've done that in terms of um, e women's equality, in terms of LGBTQ um, equality as well. We've done that in, in those spaces. So we can absolutely do that in this space of race. So yes, I mean, they, I wouldn't say it's increasing, but people are, are becoming more comfortable. Um, but also the Black Lives Matter movement has, have also, has also made Black people more comfortable, comfortable and confident in voicing the issues and standing and saying, we are not our ancestors, we will not take it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess related to that is, do you think links between Africa and Ireland are celebrated enough in the country? Or do you think there's more that could be done? I, I, what, 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 what links should we celebrate? <laughs> I, I guess the I guess the integration between ethnic minorities in Ireland because you're here to stay or we're here to stay I should include myself in that um, we're here to stay we're not going anywhere so there's no sort of you're not going to scare me to go back to <laughs> to go back to where my parents are from where my grandparents are from you know I'm yeah. here and I may as well there's Milas for example in um, Belfast in Northern Ireland, uh, the council stopped funding it uh, two, three years ago. So celebration of Indian culture, which has been um, uh, cancelled. But do, do you think an open show to celebrate your own culture is necessary? I guess like um, Gay Pride, for example, or Black History Month, rather than a month, of course, all time celebrating your heritage, where you're from, and showing that, yes, we're here to stay, and yes, we're proud of who we are. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's an, I, I, I thought initially your, your, question, your question was a historical links, which is not nice. <laughs> but, um, yes, so yes, in that sense, I think Ireland is, is very good in allowing or being very curious about the Afri African cultures. Um, they, they, in many, many parades and events that, that the state or different institutions and bodies would have, they would always, you know, do these things of culture, like these cultural diversity events, bring your food, your dance, your music, which is great. And I, I don't like that's necessary. It is good for people to see that difference and, and um, know that, you know, it's not it's not weird. This is what people wear and this is why they wear this, this is what people eat and things like that. So I think Ireland is, to be honest, the Ireland is good at celebrating our food and our dance, not so much our, um, our truth. <laughs> in terms of so our in terms of our history and our and who we are, Ireland overly celebrates our weaknesses. So there's this, you know, oh Ireland, we so many um, missionaries went to Africa to help them to save the lost souls from those tradi from their traditional religions. You know, so many Irish charities when are in Africa, feeding the the the, the, the hungry children. So there is that part of us that is celebrated that I don't, that we don't love. And we are trying to say that it's okay. Yes, of course, it's good to give and it's good to, I don't know if it's good to take people's religion away from them, but um, it is good to help those that are in need. However, you cannot, that cannot be the only story that you bring back about these people to your country. And that's why the book comes about. It, it's to, to dismantle this single-sided story that is being celebrated and and even in our history in our in, in education in ireland we learn about the civil rights movement we learn about mandela but those are our struggles <laughs> that, that's that's part of our history but it's part of the struggle in our history it's not mm -hmm. all our history so we do celebrate some um, culture and heritage of the african continent in terms of the food and the dance and the people but our history isn't told in a way that other people's histories are told. It's told from a they need help way. Well, well, I was just about to move on to your book, so that's quite a good segue. <laughs> um, do you feel your book then is representative of telling your story in your own words? Yes. In your so own way. Book, the Nigerian Heritage Coloring Book. 
so yes, yeah, so this book is yes, exactly what it's to tell our other story. The other, you know, Chimamanda and Gozia Dichi, the authors, talked about the danger of a single-sided story, and when everything that people hear about these African people is their struggles with slave with enslavement and colonization and apartheid and poverty and famine and civil war, that creates a distorted idea of about us. And it's an incorrect, it's an incomplete um, a narrative about us. So this book is to provide the other side of it, to talk about our history, our warriors, our civilizations, our governance systems, and also our food, our culture, and our the phenomenal historical architecture that are that are that we that that was created, you know, on on our land, and this other side of the story that we do not get to hear. So that's what the book is there for. That's why it's there. Does it include those sh struggles that you mentioned earlier, or is it completely far removed to celebrate the other side that people don't see? No, no. So that's so that's it's absolutely does because it needs to be a balance. Yeah. So my issue is not that um, we learn about um, MLK and uh, Mandela. My issue is we learn about MLK Mandela, but we don't learn about Queen Amina. We don't learn about Queen King Jaja Popo. We don't learn about the Great Walls of Zaria. We don't the, learn about the longest wall ever built, the Great Wall of Benin. So, so this book we talk about, but of course we don't give it as much attention. Yeah. <laughs> it's already out there. Yeah. We talk about uh, you know Badagri and the um the slave port, and again it is a children's book, so it's done in a way that it's not too heavy. Yeah. Um, so we do talk about the slave port and we do talk about the civil war in Nigeria as well. And uh, we do talk about colonization, but we talk about it as that is our past and this is what's happened to us. But we also talk about, we, we hope, we aim, we aim to present these other um, heroes of our, in literature, in governance, and inform the children and adults reading it that it's not all, that's not all we are. There's so much more to us, so we can be better, we can be greater, we can achieve and accomplish again. Is the target audience for the book the children, adults, white, black, ethnic minorities, everyone alike? Yes, it, it is indeed, it is for everybody. Because well, I grew up in Ireland where my, my, my Irish peers knew as much about Africa as I did. Yeah. So for me, it's a book that's the, in my class, all kids, in my, like, in my daughter's class, all the kids should have it because all the kids should know about this other side of the story, the balanced side of the story of the African continent of Nigeria. So yes, it's something that's, and also we, we've, we've created the book in a way that we have the coloring illustrations and then the stories, but then you can also go online for an extended experience where, for example, we talk about um, the Great Wall, the, the, the Benin Kingdom. So you, you see the images and then you, and then you, um, you, you hear the story, but then you can go online and you can see the Great Wall, and you can see the beautiful art, art and sculpture that was created that were created by the Benin people. So, so yes, yeah, so so it is for children, but then there is a deeper learning experience online that we hope adults from all walks of life, all races, all cultures can go in and dig deeper and find out more. Um, to me, that seems quite unique to have a coloring book with an interactive element at the end. Um, is there anything that inspired you towards that, or was it something that you came up with yourself? So yes, yeah, so for me it was a thing of how do we have get children to learn about Nigerian history in a way that's fun. Yeah. So I wanted them to have the information, <laughs> but without it being the tedious in you know, a book yeah. that you know they have to sit down and read. So the so the coloring aspect was what we we're like. Okay, we can make it fun by having them color in you know these the great heroes. And having them color in, you know, the, the festivals and, and the illustration is done so fantastically detailed that they can spend it as long as they want on it and that then they can go back and forth, you know, to it. So that's how it came about. And then the online experience came about because I was because it was like I want I want there's so much more we can say about about you know this. There's so much more that needs to be said about King Jaja Popo. 
but we can't say it all in this book. So actually, why don't we take them? So we talk about Atlanta, um, Atlanta in 96, when Nigeria won the Olympics. But I want them to see it. You know, you, can, you, see, you have the illustration of the footballers and you have the story of all the medals they won. But I want them to see those, the, 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 the match and the highlights. So the online, you get the link and you see as, as well. So that's wanting more. <laughs> Again, I guess that's why I'm, in, I'm still in academia. I always want to learn more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just trying to give people an, opp an opportunity to learn more was why, why it's like, why it is packaged the way it is packaged. You said when you were a child, you knew as much about Africa as your Irish peers did. Um, what changed? What made you, how did you learn more about your history and to select images or the interactive elements of your book? Um, what was that process like? Yeah, so for me, it was when, what changed? So like, I, I learned, when I went back to Nigeria at 19 or 20, so I've been in Ireland since seven, so I didn't matter, was when I saw, I was like, my goodness, we have ATMs here. We have fantastic building. We, this is not the village or the backward civilized, uncivilized nation that I had been told or that, you know, we had, because, you know, in Ireland, you see these ads about Africa from the charities and you just, you just have this idea. And my parents didn't even know that we had this idea. So they, were, they weren't even aware to combat it, you know? So when I went and I saw the truth about my country, my culture, my nation, my continent, I said, no, this is, this is there, mu there must be more. So I, I went on a journey of learning. Yeah. So I started learning about our history, the culture, the, our religions, the traditional religions. I started learning because it's like, oh, African religion, no, oh, that's juju. No, it's, it wasn't juju. That was just a different religion. Like we have yeah. Islam, Buddhism. It was simply different, you know. So when I, when that was what changed, when I went home and I saw, and I said, wow, there's so much more to this nation than I thought. So I decided to dig deeper. How have you found the feedback so far? Is Do you feel it's been received as you've wanted it to be received? And has there been anything that's stuck with you in particular with regards to the feedback or criticism? Yes. So the feedback, we've gotten fantastic feedback, which which I'm so pleased about because it, it's been a lot of work. It's been you know, three years in the making because yeah. we, we wanted to do it justice. We wanted to do Nigeria justice. We wanted to do the characters in the book justice. So a lot of detail went into it. And we have had a lot of positive feedback, negative feedback as well, which we've taken into account. I mean, the image on the editing, if the, so the cover of the book is a, a Fulani woman wearing a Yoruba gele with the Benin artifacts behind. So, and those are like different parts of Nigeria. So for the Fulani, we got, we got some feedback from some ordinaries who said, why would you have Fulani's representing Nigeria or Nigerian books don't you know that they are they are the Boko Haram who are killing us and things like that and I was like goodness like I, <laughs> so you can be like so that I wouldn't say it was negative but it was criticism because I understood that this person's family has been hurt by you know by this and so but I but I, I try to explain that we also talk about the civil war we have all hurt each other in the past and some, yes, some hurt is being done in the present, but that doesn't make us any less Nigerian. Like it's, we shouldn't excommunicate, you know, the Fulanis from Nigeria because some Fulanis, a number of them are doing, are doing things that aren't so good, you know? So, so there has been that, you know, clash of the different ethnic groups and, yeah. and um, yes. And then also some ethnic, Nigeria is a nation that has like two, what, 200 ethnic groups or something like that. So we've had some people say, my, my, my ethnic group is not in this. <laughs> <laughs> we only had 50 pictures. <laughs> we, could not in, in, we couldn't put everybody in it. So that's been the good and bad feedback we've had. I was gonna say, at least, at least they ended on good feedback. Um, for everyone listening, uh, where can you buy the book? Uh, where is it available? And feel free to show it off again. Yes, yes. So the book is available at Afrocolor Studios, afrocolor.com. So that's Afrocolor, the my username, .com, C-O-M. So this is the book. This is a cover. I'll give you a, a, a sneak page, a sneak view. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, so this, how it is. So that's illustration and then text. So this is um, Queen Nana 
<laughs> it just happens to be my, my namesake. <laughs> but um, but yes, and then our national theatre and the story behind it as well. So that's how that's how the book is. And then when you when you buy the book, you have um, access to the online experience for further information. If you don't buy the book, you don't have access to that and um, that content. So yeah. Um. Well, I'm getting. Sorry, go on. Yes, yeah, so AfroColorStudio.com. Yeah, no problem. Um, AfroColor.com. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> now you're fine. We'll let everyone know. Um, okay. as far as possible, we'll let everyone everyone know where to get it. Um, it's the last 10 minutes, so my questions are over, but I'm going to hand it over to some um, studio questions, I guess, audience questions, rather. Um, how do you set about doing research for the book, then? No? So, yeah, so it, the research it was really actually, because, again, this book is like my baby, it came about when my, I, was, I was pregnant with my daughter and I wanted her to have I wanted to. I was thought, what do I want her to know about Nigeria that I that would have benefited me, and what do I want her generation to know about Nigeria? That's how we started. Now it's like everybody. <laughs> so, so I wanted her because of course I was having a girl, so I wanted there to be strong female voices. So search for all the great female leaders, and there were so many <laughs> actually, which was fantastic because you know prior to colonization, women were were rulers in Nigeria and they were leading their, their 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 people so that was great and then also wanted to know about the, the so that the history that part of it, in terms of women so the history so we talk about colonization we talk about slavery so and then our leadership what I want to because right now in Nigeria we we have um a lot of issues with our leaders so I wanted the next generation to know that this isn't us we're not bad leaders we're not incapable of leading ourselves we have had good leaders in the past and so we, we present these good leaders of course things have happened over time that has led to um to bad leadership but yeah so i wanted what is it that i didn't know that would have been helpful was what we basically put in the book so yeah our leadership our culture and also our the we talk about the different ethnic groups so that's something that we do actually focus on quite a bit the different ethnic groups and then also we talk about the different religions as well, the traditional religion, we talk about Islam, we talk about Christianity as well, because that's something that you can't talk about Nigeria without talking about the religion, because we're, we tend to be quite religious people. And yes, and then just the art as well, the games that children play and just, so I wanted to, I wanted to put in the book things that I think would have been helpful to me as a child, things that are helpful to, for people to know and have a, a more complete understanding of a country. Um, we've got a question here from Peter Shirlow, who's the uh, head of the Institute of Irish Studies. He's listening. Um, he says, in the past few years, the far right and Catholic nationalist groups have emerged, such as the National Party, Yellow Vests, and Irish Freedom Parties, and others. Do you think society and the media are taking that threat and menace of these groups seriously? No, not, not seriously enough, because, I mean, I... I we did some those that work in the NGO sector. We saw this coming because it's been bubbling in, in the rest of the EU, and of course our neighbours, you guys, with our Brexit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so we, we knew that it was coming, and it, so but people didn't don't take it too seriously. I don't think people understand how organised these they're not they're not isolated. It's not just little parties. They, they are connected to wider groups in Europe and America. So um, yeah, we're not taking it as seriously as we, sh as we should, but they are very, very, very serious and potentially very dangerous to the stability of um, Ireland as a nation that embraces equality, not just for minorities, but for women's rights, yeah. for the rights of, um, of LGBTQ people as well. Because I mean, from when, I, when, when we were in the EU, in the Europe part of my work, we saw a lot of these a lot of these parties came from christian these extreme christian ideologies so i mean they don't like jews same way they don't like women being in power same way they don't like lgbtq same way they don't like blacks so it's a threat to the civilization that we are creating in ireland in terms of being one that promotes equality and diversity and i don't think people take it as seriously as we as we should 
Do you think these groups have become empowered in the same way that Black Lives Matter um, movement helped empower um, young black people with social media and that sort of presence? Do you think it's the exact same that's been happening with the far right? Yes, definitely, definitely. And I, the, our, the social media um, um, platforms don't help in, in the way they target. You only see what you're interested in. So it just creates this deeper ignorance and this deeper narrow-mindedness and yes, it's, yeah, it's quite dangerous. Well, I have another question for you myself because I think that's all the audience questions. If anyone has any more, just hit Q&A and you can ask there. Is there any particular um, images in the book yourself that uh, rings true, I guess, with you or any that's your favorite, um, as it were? Yeah, so my favorite is, it's, it's a bit hard to pick out. Let me just get the title correct. Yeah, so it's it, my favorite would be our independence heroes. So, and why that is my favorite, why that's in the book, because again, like I said, when I was a child, I didn't know we spoke English because we were colonized. <laughs> I just thought we yeah. spoke English. <laughs> so, learning about independence that Nigeria um, fought for and, and got from the British was something that for me was phenomenal. And not just Nigeria, also, I, I learned about independence of other African countries. So, like, Ghana, the work that Kwame Nkrumah did and the work of our independence heroes as well. So the reason why that for me is my favorite story is because it, it tells me that our leadership and we're good and it, was, and it is very possible for Nigerians to be good leaders. Because when you're raised in this sense of inferiority complex that you do a bit unfortunately develop as a black person in the western world you kind of think that your people are incapable of certain things and white people are more capable than you are yeah. so when i learned about this about our independence heroes and all and the different <laughs> this is more the leaders pre um, colonization and slavery for me it just it warmed my heart and it gave me gives me hope for the future yes that's my favorite yeah no that's it's exactly what you want, I suppose. If you're if you're looking to educate people, then you're looking to inspire them, and um, that is what you're um, looking for. Um, there's one more question that popped up there in the Q and A. Um, oh, or not? Um, well, thank you very much, I suppose. Then uh, Nana for joining us. Um, do you want to remind everyone where you can get your where they can get your book again? Yes. Yeah, so Afrocolor.com. It's um, currently on sale for the month of October, you know, celebrating Black History Month. So that's where you can get it for £15. Very well. Thank you very much for having us on behalf of the Institute of Virus Studies and for myself. Uh, thanks for joining us, Nana. Thank you so much for having me. No, no problem. Cheers. Thank you.